Welcome back, everybody. It's Friday afternoon, and it's time for another episode of Giles McCoy Live, your spot for tech, hi-fi, and gaming. Today is episode 312. That's right, season three, episode 12. And joining us this afternoon is Terry Madalin from Prime Air. Terry, welcome. How are you? Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm, I'm well. And yourself? Oh, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful day. I've got a great guest. It could be so much worse. So, you know, I think things are good. You know, <laughs> this is, I, I love this stuff. So I'm, I'm in a, a really good spot. So, you know, today we're going to talk about Prime Air mm -hmm. and uh, you are Mr. Prime Air Marketing, right? Yeah. Although, <laughs> although it should be understand, understood that we're here in Scandinavia and particularly in Sweden. So there's a very flat management style here. So it really is, you'll notice I put marketing in a lower case letter to start. <laughs> sure. Um, uh, we have a small team here in Malmö, Sweden, which is just across the Orison Sound from Copenhagen. Um, and we all contribute uh, based on our strengths uh, to the running of the company. Um, and so, yeah, I get involved with a lot of different things, but marketing is my focus. Great. You know, uh, to kick off episodes, we typically talk a little bit about who you are as the guest and why people should care. And then we break into, uh, you know, the the company or the brand and, and talk a little bit about that. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you became associated with Prime Air, how, how that all happened, because you sound American, right? <laughs> Um, but you're not in it. So, you know, maybe there's some interesting story there. And then a little bit about who Primary is and, and what, what they do. Great. Well, I'll try to be brief about both, but particularly the first part of this. <laughs> um, uh, for many, many, uh, you're right. Uh, I was born in North Dakota in the United States to Norwegian bachelor farmer parents. Um, hence my last name, Maydalen, as Norwegian. Uh, but for many, many years, well, actually for 50 years, I've been in the audio industry. And for a number of those was with Sumiko the distribution company in the United States. And that was in part responsible for bringing Prime Air into their distribution arm. And so that was almost 25 years ago now. And so in one role or another, I've been working with Prime Air, either with Sumiko or as a consultant. And then about six years ago, I moved over to Sweden and uh, am working now with Prime Air full time. That, that's awesome. You know, I love... Uh... I love stories of people who have the opportunity to travel a lot and specifically folks that have the opportunity to move and live in other countries and experience, you know, those cultures immersively. So a little, a little envious, I've only been able to spend, you know, a month at a time overseas. Uh, yeah. But uh, I, I take it that you have adapted well and, and everything is good living across oh, the pond. I love it here. Um, yeah. I love it here. And, and, um, uh, and so, yeah, I, I, I love the work. I love the community. Uh, I love the area. Well, and partly because this area, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's often referred to as the Orison, which is this region of southern Sweden, and then the island on which Copenhagen is, and then the adjoining island in, in Denmark, where there is this concentration of electronic manufacturers um, mm -hmm. in the audio field that is extraordinary. I mean, the dynamic speaker was invented in Denmark. We've got B&O, we've got DALI, we've got Dynaudio, we've got Gato, we've got Audio Vector, we've got all of these different companies are kind of based in and around this general area. And so there's this great kind of almost excitement that happens here around that concentration of manufacturers and designers. Ice Power is here, a number of other manufacturers and the like are here. And in fact, Melmo is kind of a, a secret weapon in that in 2014, I think it was, it was named the fourth most innovative city in the world. Um, wow. And partly that was due to the work of Sony Ericsson here and all the patents that they provided. And as a result of that, there's been an energy in the development of all kinds of technologies. We're the home of non-dairy milks, for example, whether it's oat milk or, or potato milk or pea milk. Uh, but also it's become a huge gaming center, a huge game design center. Um, and in fact, it's predicted that with the uh, creation of the Malmo University in kind of adjacent to the ancient university, Lund University, which is only 10 minutes away, that it was the university was designed as a startup incubator. And it right. is felt or estimated that seven startups happen every day here in Melbourne. That's and so amazing. Yeah, it truly is. It truly is. 
and uh, and so we're able to kind of feed on that and 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 take that energy because we started the company started in Copenhagen. Uh, Bo, Bo Christensen, the famous industrial designer in the audio world, was the founder, um, and he tapped an amazing engineer by the name of Bent Nielsen, who's our engineer to this day. So he's been with the company now for thirty six years, um, and they did these kind of amazing and almost outrageous designs. There was the original nine twenty eight, which was this kind of blocky, kind of almost uh, fundamental kind of design that was great for Bent in aligning all the circuits for them to work most sympathetically together. Then Bo designed the 200 series, which some people may remember as being this thing that looks like a spaceship has landed, a stainless mm -hmm. steel spaceship has landed on your, on your audio cabinet. That one was trickier. It, it, it was almost at the service of the industrial design, so it forced Bent to kind of make some compromises in its basic electrical design which then led to the 300 series. And the 300 series was in a much more conventional shape. And in fact, this shape informs all of primary industrial designs from this point on up to the present day. And that allowed Bent to exercise his kind of uncanny ability uh, to make all of these kind of component circuits that form an entire audio component to work best together. And that's really important for us because we don't have a dedicated full-time design and engineering team outside of Bent. What we've done over the years is tapped these really amazing specialist designers to contribute basic component circuits. So if that's say a power supply or an amplifier module or a digital signal processing or digital control. For example, we tapped for our first apps, the guy who's designed all the Sony Ericsson music streaming applications. In fact, he just kind of showed up at our door one day. And so we're able to take all of these specialist designers, admittedly um, not have to pay a full-time compensation package, sure. get their best work and then bent somehow is able to put it together in a way that simply that whole cliche of the sum being greater than its parts in a right. way that's just kind of magic. Um, and, and we can even, I'll, I'll try to be brief in this story, um, Seaman Oliver, the general manager, and I tend to do all of the listening, the voicing of the products. And our sound, our sound system, our demo system is at the opposite end of the building from the tech system. And we've gotten in the habit, and it's almost a bit of a joke, for us to open the door of the sound room and yell, Oh, Bent, and he has, he's never failed to come running, um, kind of, okay, what'd you hear? Uh, and we'll describe something in the most obscure, vague audiophile terms. You know, we could use a little bit of this. We could use a little bit of that. It was and, just a little too airy and yellow. Well, yeah, oh, exactly. To do. Stupid stuff like that. And Bent will, he, he will respond in two ways. He will say, I'll think about it, which means probably he'll have something tomorrow. Or he will say, give me 10 minutes. And usually five minutes later, he will set something down in the demo room. He won't tell us what he's done. Uh, and we have to listen to him. And almost inevitably, he has somehow been able to transform our vague notions into some reality that, oddly enough, fits exactly what we were describing him, exactly what we wanted him to do. Um, and so that's where we're at now with the current product line, where this guy who's been doing this for so long uh, designed something like the new A35.8 amplifier, which is just, uh, I, know I, I, I know it's going to sound like I'm a fictional, disingenuous comment. It's amazing. <laughs> and the weird thing is, is that it keeps amazing us. Seaman and I continue to listen to it. And we put it in different shows. We just were at Expona. Um, mm -hmm. And we did a show where we were driving these amazing Alta Audio speakers. And this eight-channel amplifier, we can bridge all four pairs and then buy amplify a speaker that you can buy wire to get just great results. And so these Alta Audios with the A35.8 were just singing. Uh, in ways that I, I, when we first proposed doing this amplifier, I could have never imagined. Uh, um, it just does this thing. It locks on to speakers that really it should have, if you judge by price, no business driving to the level that it's uh, able to make them sound. So so it, it, he does this. He amazes us all the time with this kind of stuff. And and the worst part is that he's Danish. Um, <laughs> That's the worst part, everyone. Uh, That's the take-up message. I, I he's up Danish. On. Oh, my God. I have to back up on this. <laughs> One of the reasons why I think they hired me uh, to come in and do marketing is that I could 
see the basic philosophies of the company in a way that they could not. That they, it was so entrenched, it was so ingrained, it was so culturally ingrained. And, and we can talk about concepts like logom uh, that informs all of Swedish society that then in turn informs our product. This idea of everything in balance and proportion, not too much, not too little, uh, just right. Everything has to be just right. And, and part of that is you don't brag. You don't talk about yourself. And that was that was a difficult thing when I first got here. I we had had an amplifier and I made the mistake of saying, it's the best amplifier that primaries ever made. And they went, oh, 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 oh no, 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 no. <laughs> Probably the best amplifier. You don't ever want to say, you don't ever want to say something like it is the best. And so Bent doesn't self-promote. And so we get this A35.8 amp, and I'm doing a video about it. And I, I'm in the other part of the warehouse where it's quiet and I can, I can shoot the videos and I would stop and I might go to the bathroom. I might go get some coffee and Ben, ben would go, now, did you happen to mention this? And I'm going, no, no, no one's told me about this. And he obviously was so proud, but he couldn't really bring himself to kind of brag about what he designed is that the design kind of unfolded the various aspects of what he's done, what he's done. And it's brilliant, but it would take, many episodes of your of your show to, for me to discuss all of it so so we'll have to leave it at that i guess well i think this is a great segue into product itself right you know a lot uh -huh. of people a lot of people know the brand and uh, mm -hmm. you know like you said you were at exponia you're at the shows um so you are by far uh, you know a, a well-known industry entity but there are going to be some folks that are coming in they're like who who are these people? Oh, yeah. they sell so um let me share up the website and we can run through uh, the product portfolio just a little bit. And then at the, mm -hmm. the tail end of that, um, there's a, uh, a product that is going to be near and dear to my heart that I want to dig into a little bit more. So everybody stick around for that one. Um, and for folks that are just joining us, uh, you know, we are talking about Prime Air and uh, Terry has joined us and he is giving us the grand tour. <laughs> All right. So here's the, the the website. And, you know, when when you get to this website and you open it up, you see this beautiful background i mean you just you're like oh look at this you know it feels nice i'll let our, I'll let our web designer know because we use all these hero images these beautiful images of scandinavia to kind of set the tone and i would love to change this to something new and different but our graphic designer who i, I dearly love and uh, a swedish sweden lego master by the way just to give oh, you a nice view of your, um uh he loves this so much that we'll never be able to use anything else it just is it just speaks to him and to us uh about fogs and swedish pine trees so um there you have uh, no it's it's gorgeous it's beautiful and i think it does set a tone for people coming to the website rather than just being you know kind of confronted with product immediately um you're like okay I get a feeling of what's going on here. Um, and uh, I, I like the comment about Legos as I look up and see my Legos here. Um, so yeah, we, we won't talk about that, but yeah, there, there are a few. Um, well, that's a whole nother episode. What they did on this show. Really is. It's a whole different channel. Um, so let's, uh, let's start out and we'll talk about, let's talk about uh, network players a bit. And it looks like, uh, you know, you have, there are four different series, the five, 15, 25 and, and 35. Mm -hmm. And so what is, uh, is, is there anything to note other than, okay, they, they stream or are these well, playing files? This is actually, this is actually the, a really good place to last... start. This is a really good place to start yeah. because what you see here is essentially um, our amplification range. So the 15 series, 25 series, 35 series. The 15 series is our compact three quarter size chassis components, kind of entry level, if you will, but jam packed, filled with technology and including things like the i15 Prisma, which is an integrated amplifier, DAC and network player. The SC15 Prisma is essentially the preamplification version of that. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and then as you move on, I'm going to be, I'm going to go too fast for you. I fear here. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, before we leave the SC15, one of the unique features there is that it has WISA and uh, wireless network speaker connection um, as a, an option for those who might want to be using that technology to connect their speakers. Uh, but then you go up into, say, the 25 and the 35 series, and those are our full-sized units, a standard width unit. Um, but those are modular. 
And so they can be had as an analog only integrated amplifier, um, or you can add the DAC module, or you can add the Prisma network player module, um, either at purchase or as time goes on, if you need to add those units. And those are easily installed by any consumer. And it yeah, gives it us like the in ability. This photo that you can see the, uh, the bus where they would yep. plug in internally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the I-25, is, is it's effectively uh, 100 watts per channel and it has unbalanced inputs or RCA inputs. The I-35 is a little more powerful at 150 watts and it has balanced uh, input circuitry for it. And then the little guy, the little NP5 Prisma, is our effort to make sure that all of our existing customers who were early adopters of our first streaming platform could update to the latest streaming technology. We were one of the first adopters of streaming and really felt that it was um, the future for music delivery. And as a result, we designed it in some cases well before any of the streaming platforms we now take for granted uh, were available. So uh, Spotify had just started, uh, Tidal had yet to exist, Cobuzz had yet to exist. And so as a result, because we were so early on board, they reached a point where we simply couldn't update the old platform anymore. And so what we decided to do was take the Prisma module. Now, this is the same module that's in our big pre-35, the pre-amplifier version of the i35 that we saw among mm -hmm. the integrated amplifiers. Um, it's the same circuitry, but we packaged it to make it as inexpensive as possible, uh, including choosing to use a, a switch mode power supply, kind of wall socket power supply so that we could offer that to our existing customers and for that matter, those who just simply had a digital input, whether they're our customers or not, the Prisma network player technology. And so it gives you a full suite of streaming capabilities. And in fact, as we learned various lessons in our first iteration of our streaming technology, we wanted to make it somewhat open sourced. And so we decided that we would make the casting from any of the streaming platforms dependent upon AirPlay and Chromecast, meaning mm -hmm. that anyone who wanted to use virtually any streaming service, they could cast very easily with it. We also added Spotify Connect uh, in addition to that, as well as then with the various um, iOS and Android Google functions, we even have voice control. And so there is this idea then that anyone in the household, which is really important to us, is that everyone in the household should be able to enjoy listening to great music. It shouldn't just be the purview of uh, a single member of the household. Right. And that everyone should be able to have access to it. And this is particularly important to us when it comes to things like home theater products. This should be the entertainment center for uh, anyone's home, at least in our opinion. And part of this is fueled by a, a concept here in Scandinavia called Hygge, uh, which translates as cozy. And it is this idea that the most satisfying experience you can have is sharing food and drink, music and movies with family and friends. And, and, and this is really important to the point where there's even something on Friday called Freitagsmus, which means Friday cuddle. Um, Freydox, the work day. I think we're going to start having Freydox moose here. Oh, you like should. That. It's the it's the greatest thing because Friday after work, everyone gets together. They make something simple to eat in front of the television and watch a movie or a TV program or listen to music together. And it's a tradition. In fact, um, uh, as an example of why they wanted me to do marketing, I came in one day having just discovered this whole idea of Freydox moose. And I was describing it to Seaman, the managing, the general manager, who's Dutch. And he said, what are you talking about? You know, first it's Higa, then it's Lagum, now there's this Freydux moose. What are you talking about? And I described it to him. And on his face, there began this dawning understanding. And he said, we do that. I do that. I didn't even know there was a name for it. And yet everyone, not everyone, but most people here in Sweden do that. Get a big bag of candy, lots of potato chips, usually tacos, and you sit and you enjoy this system. Um, and there is, and I'm, I'm going on at length and I got to be careful, but there is a guy, I don't know if you know him, Daniel Levitan, who wrote the book, Your Brain on Music. Uh-huh. Oh, heavily recommended. But Daniel did a research product for Apple uh, Music and Sonos, where he put in cameras in 150 households and did exit and ent entrance and exit interviews to find out the effect of having a sound system to play music out loud would have on the household. And everything improved. 
people sat, spent more time together, sat closer together, stood closer together, made more meals together, thought those meals tasted better. Um, you know, their favorite uh, music calmed them down. But my favorite, he was so academic with this because he does have a PhD from McGill University. He said that parent and partner in bed awake time, wink, wink, improved by 67%. So not making any claims, but you know, it's a good idea uh, to be playing your system out loud. And so, and so this, the NP5 Prism is meant then to integrate that kind of streaming platform into any one system with a digital input, whether they're ours or someone else's. And it's been extraordinarily popular. Uh, it's very flexible, room ready, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's awesome. And uh, I think I know what the next addition is gonna be to the bedroom two channel system. It can't hurt. I'm not it, making any guarantees, but it can't hurt. It can't I, I think, hurt. Uh, you know, some, some primary technology is, is going to be a prime addition. <laughs> it's Swedish, after all. <laughs> That's right, Swedish. <laughs> all right let's so let's uh, let's move on and we're gonna we're gonna need to plow through these a little bit because i want to have time to talk about the uh the item there at the end that i'm very interested in um, yeah and and, and 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 so the line continues with uh, cd players and in fact people have asked us why we continue to produce them and yet um our cd transports the dd15 and dd35 are incredibly popular in fact outselling our full cd players even the CD35 that you can include the Prisma module inside of it. So it's a complete digital resource from disc playback to stored and streamed media. Um, we do phono stages. I'm particularly proud of those. Um, they're really value oriented. And it's the combination of actually three different design, actually four different designers, power supply, moving magnet stage, moving coil stage. And all of that came together in just a way that was really quite wonderful. So we have the R15, the compact, Three quarter size series, and then the R35, which is an extraordinarily flexible uh, moving coil, moving magnet, uh, balanced output phono stage. Um, and those are really good. In fact, numbers of reviewers are using them for their cartridge reviews, given that it's a great sounding, relatively reasonably priced phono stage that they can do. Uh, cartridge reviews and then not be accused of using some super high end product and yet still getting great results. And so and, and it's beautiful. I mean, it's just gorgeous. Well, and that, that, that center button, so you see the primer logo in the center. So for any of our basic amplifiers as well as our phono stages, that's the standby button right there in the middle. Mm -hmm. You can't see it. In fact, very often I have to, I get questions in where I can't turn on my phono stage. And I go, okay, press that center button there and it will take it out of standby. It will light up, it will produce sound. And then by pressing it in and holding it for five seconds, you can actually take it out of auto standby. A lot of our equipment has auto standby features built into it so that it does reduce the, the impact on, on power going into it. Um, and so all of that, all of those are lovely. And that's a hallmark also of our product. You see the look and feel of Scandinavia. We believe that our products should be simple and elegant so that they, again, can be put into most living room environments so that they can be used in appreciation by the whole household. So we take everything into consideration, this kind of idea of log. Um, everything in balance and proportion. Even the fact that you can't quite see it here, we only use three feet uh, because four feet is one too many, two feet is too few, three is just right. It's right. Um, and, and so with that in mind, we do the phono stages and then obviously what we're, or maybe not so obviously, what we're returning to is uh, the home cinema. Uh, first with the introduction of the A35.88 channel amplifier that we've talked about. Uh, that is ability to configure it into a variety of settings. That A35.8 with our A35.2 can virtually provide any multi-channel system configuration you might have, all the way from 5.1, 7.1, 5.1.2, 7.1.4, et etc., cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you all the way up to a full Oro 3D system. And so the flexibility that Bent designed into this is remarkable, but then the internal design is intense. Um, I don't know if you can go to the in internal picture here. There you go. You can kind of see it there uh, where that little red light was lit up. There is this sense that what Ben did was take these, you can see the module there. I'm pointing to it as if you can see me point where, yeah, exactly right there. That's actually a Hypex module. And, and we determined that we wouldn't use our proprietary UFPD2 uh, in part because when you're doing class D design, the math, the science is so precise 
that there really is only so many things you can do. So whether it's Hypex, whether it's Purify, whether it's Pascal, whether it's Ice Power, everyone is going obviously down a particular path. And Hypex has been doing it for a long time. And these Encore modules were so good and are produced in such quantities, much greater quantities than we can produce our own proprietary design in order to keep our price down, in order to make to, make, to reach our goal of providing the best possible experience for the greatest number of people, we never want to make our products inaccessible. We know they're not cheap, but we want to make sure that for the quality we want to provide, that they're as reasonably priced as possible. And so Ben started working with these Hypex modules and realized that he could situate them inside these heatsink modules. So that there's a pair of these modules inside each of these heatsinks. Now that heat sink serves to isolate the amplifier module from the power supply. So any noise that might be generated by this extraordinarily powerful power supply, 1500 watts is what it can deliver, that that noise is isolated. And then the noise that the amplifier module might uh, uh, generate is isolated from the input and output stage. And so as you look at that input output stage, it's an incredibly short signal path. In fact, Bent designed the circuit sort board so that it's an uninterrupted ribbon of circuit board that goes from the input to the amp module through the heatsink so that in and of itself is, 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 is isolated in that regard, and then back out to the output stage. So the, and not that this is gonna have any relation, but that's the length of the circuit. Right, That 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 is a, massive power supply i mean that Huge. that almost can, could could consume a 15 amp circuit here in the u.s almost well, in, in fact we had to put an iec 19 socket on it uh so a 20 amp cord is uh, necessary mm -hmm. uh to connect to this thing and the great thing is because of the efficiency of class d we can get um, effectively 1500 watts of power out of this unit. So in that system we described for Xpona, um, there's a limit to full power range just in the way protection circuit works. So each channel of that Alta audio speaker at Xpona was being delivered 740 watts of power. That's that is for folks that don't know that that's a lot. Of power. That's a lot. That's, a that's lot. an unnecessary amount. That's an, or, but the great thing about it too is that the the power supply is adaptive, so it delivers the power as the channels need it. So there are instances where, say, your height speakers are doing nothing, but your front, left, center, and rights are being asked to deliver a massive soundtrack. Well, that power is diverted there uh, to within its limits. So it has this ability to to really produce not only amazing sound, but just set up exactly the way you might need it. Again, in conjunction uh, on, at times with our A35.2 stereo amplifier. And, 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 and so it's, 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 as you can tell, I'm a little bit excited about this thing. Um, it turned out better than we could have possibly hoped for um, uh, and has, has been uh, well-reviewed and well-received, uh, uh, even without the benefit of our uh, uh, surround sound processor preamplifier, which we're gonna be delivering in the fall. And which segues, that is a great segue because this is what I really want to talk about. I was hoping you would. The SPA25 Prisma uh, multi-channel integrated amplifier, perhaps. Uh, this, so, you know, I love two-channel, but multi-channel home theater is, uh, is a big deal for me. It's really close to my heart. Yeah. And uh, I was really happy to see this product, product announced uh, because it, it looks like a winner to me. I mean, it's just... It's it's beautiful, uh, and, and it does everything that you need it to do. And I hope that it sounds as good as it looks. Just it, it, yeah, take go go ahead and tell us about it. But this this is just outstanding. Well, I, I thanks for those kind words, and and I really appreciate that. I can't tell you how much because this has been a difficult product to design, in part because it was designed during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was designed, uh, it, the design process began just before the AKM chip fire, the factory fire that destroyed the AKM chip yep. factory. This was filled with AKM chips when it was first designed, which meant that we had to switch over to ESS chips, which produce more heat. Um, uh, and so we had to redesign the, um, 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 uh, the heat sinking and the heat dissipation aspects of the unit. Um, there are all kinds of things. I won't go through the trouble of it, but what has come out, the result of it, um, uh, I really, really love. And I, and I say this in part because it might be important to know, or it might be interesting to know, that I have a parallel career as a film teacher and video producer. 
um, really? with a specialty in film sound and have worked with a lot. I've actually worked for and with Dolby for a while and, and interviewed and worked with dozens of, of Academy Award winning sound designers and like. And I know what goes into creating a surround sound movie soundtrack. Um, it is an art of such incredible sophistication um, and, and works in ways that we're not even aware of as they essentially shift our attention and manipulate our emotions just through the use of sound. And, and it always concerns me a little bit when people make this artificial distinction between music and movie sound, uh, prioritizing music as somehow being uh, superior or, or more sophisticated, when in fact music is really in the usual kind of division of this, only one third of a movie soundtrack. It's mm -hmm. music, it's yes. dialogue, Dialogue is the thing that we're ear, our ears are most attuned to and that we will uh, immediately recognize as not being recorded appropriately for the environment in which the voice is, is coming from. And then there are the effects. And when we talk about effects, it's not just the big explosions. It is those tiny details that you and I are aware of every day. And in fact, on Hollywood sound stages and mixing stages, there are terabytes of just the ringtones of cell phones so that they can select the precise cell phone because they know that if the cell phone that rings and the, uh, the audience has identified what that is, if it's not the right tone, it'll take them out of the movie. Uh, all of a sudden, it will not seem real. It will seem false. And so all of this is done to create this amazing fabric that we then enter into that is this incredible experience. And so this product really exemplifies our desire in our primary practical design approach to pack in as much as we can with the highest level of performance so that uh, no matter what you want to look at or listen to, you'll be able to have that with a, 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 as good quality as we possibly can provide. And so that means that we've done a few things that make it maybe a little bit different than what others might be. So it's a nine channel amplifier built in, 11 channels of processing, you have the ability to add another pair and an A35.2 stereo amp, for example, to get to the full 11 channels. Right. Um, uh, we also then, with the same kind of power supply that we're using in A35.8, it allocates, it's adaptive, so it allocates its power delivery to the various channels. So while this is rated at 90 watts, nine channels driven, at any point, if a channel demands it, it can, be, it can deliver up to 145 watts. So here again, to use the example I've already used, left, center, right is playing this massive soundtrack, not much happening in your upper speakers. The power that's being delivered to the upper speakers is only sufficient to do that job. Any additional power is being sent to your left, center, and right speakers. And then additionally, kind of because of how well I think uh, bridging and biamping our stereo amps have been, you're able to biamp with this integrated amplifier the right. left and right speakers. And so at that point, you go to um, uh, uh, effectively uh, 290 uh, watts per left and right channel um, in a biamp mode. And so it really provides that capability then for music and movies. We designed this for music and movies. Uh, for whatever you want to listen to, whatever you want to experience, we'll hopefully deliver the best possible performance. Now we've also put in Dirac so that you can do the, the amazingly sophisticated um, uh, uh, surround sound processing, uh, DSP processing that they provide. I should mention it's also a Swedish company, but I'm not saying that's why we included it. Uh, in <laughs> no, the it's, it's one of the leaders in the industry is why. It's, it's, it's oh, amazing. it's amazing. Yeah. The precision, and that's, and that's the only thing that maybe people should be aware of is that its capabilities are so great that while any consumer can use it to great effect, it offers up um, a, a whole range of sophisticated and subtle alterations to your system that in some cases you may even want to get a professional to come help you with it uh, because it is so extremely capable uh, in what it could do down to the finest kind of minute uh, adjustment details. And most importantly, it, it folds in the phase relationships with I, which a lot of the other uh, digital signal processing systems don't do. And that's really critical as we move into the immersive sound systems, as opposed to the, to the channel uh, balance adjustment uh, uh, sound design 
that would happen in movies. And so I remember the transition when, when uh, Alan Allen showed me um, Atmos for the first time. It wasn't called Atmos yet. And we were talking about how you had to adjust the output of the different various channels to be able to play sounds in various locations in the sound field. And when he said, all we need to do now is point, and he just pointed to where he wanted the sound to come from, and it came from that spot. Right. Uh, it came from just up there. Uh oh, just up there. Um, and it was remarkable what we can do now, or what they can do now, uh, in the production of it, and then we can do in the, in the reproduction of it. That that phase relationship that Dirac is able to provide is is critical to get that last little bit of, of subtle differentiation among the various channels. Now, when is the, uh, this, this product is still not yet released. Oh, it's correct? just released. I'm so happy we're talking about it now. Okay. Oh, yeah, so it, it is out there. You can purchase this now. Yep. That's yep. outstanding. Yeah. And, you know, the, and, and this, this is a rather reasonable price too. Um, that I'm glad you think so because we worked really hard, um, uh, to again, try to make it accessible. We want this to be, again, our goal is to provide the best possible experience for the greatest number of people. And so there's always that balance, again, log on. Um, uh, we very carefully judge what it is that we put into the various products, which kind of informs our, our primary practical design approach. We put everything into balance. How much will this cost, not only in real terms, like in retail price, but how much will it cost in future maintenance and management? Um, does it really provide a substantial improvement in performance that warrants its inclusion in the product? Or is it included simply for, and I'm going to say a horrible word, marketing purposes, right. when in actual fact, it may not have really the kind of use value that a customer might expect uh, as they look down a features list? Yeah, so this is another uh, great segue, um, because one one topic that I want to talk about before we close today is the practical design philosophy of Prime Air. And, uh, you know, I'm curious how this really informs choices and decisions that are made when, when, when all different aspects are being considered, right? So this is everything like, like we've alluded to in the past, uh, you know, pricing, design, feature set. So can you tell me a little bit about that process and, oh, yeah. and how that really yeah. impacts the products? Well, in fact, it's great that we were we've been talking about the SPA twenty five because this one has has two of the elements that maybe best exemplify this primary practical design approach. And again, that's based on this kind of Scandinavian Swedish concept of logum: not too much, not too little, um, uh, everything in balance and proportion, just right. So we want to make sure that any feature we put in here contributes fundamentally to better performance. And as the marketing person, I know that if we put certain elements into our feature list, a consumer will look at that and be comforted to know that they have all the latest features. And that's an easy way of, of, of designing a product. Um, additionally, there are things that I know that can be very eye-catching on a sales floor, that when you get them home, you find that you really never use them. It's kind of like the buying your flat panel television in a big box store. Those warehouses are massive. And so that 85 inch flat screen TV doesn't look that big uh, in that warehouse setting. And the minute you get it home, you realize it's just dominating and you're on the phone. Hey, that 65 inch will be just fine. Thank you very much. I need to return this 85. And so that happens a lot. And so I'll give you two examples. One is the front display. And the other is um, video switching, video resolution specifications. Um, and so I'll do, which I should do first, but let's let's start out with the display. This will be somewhat similar. Yeah, we people can see that people see. here now. Yeah, and so, and so you can see it's relatively small. It doesn't dominate the appearance of the product and it's meant to provide or continue that elegant, simple uh, design approach that we have become known for. Now, we've been doing OLED displays. We were one of the first actually to incorporate OLED displays. And we have examined the idea of having a large mm, color touchscreen display, in part because when we started 36 years ago, we included remote control as a necessary feature for the best possible experience when listening to your system. Now, at that point, remote control was considered evil in the worlds of high-end audio in part because you had to inject that remote control system into the signal path 
and people would go to the length, including we did, uh, to put motorized volume pots with discrete resistors at each volume setting or at each attenuation setting. And But knowing that being able to control that volume from the listening position was the best spot. So we believe in having this level of control, but from the listening position. And so we began to examine these large scale touchscreen displays. We realized, well, wait, we don't want to go to the unit to touch. We don't want to have to be able to kind of kneel down in front of the unit to touch these controls. We want to do it from the palm of your hand. We want to do it from the listening position. And oddly enough, I happen to have one of these devices here. We live in a world filled with amazing displays in the palm of your hand from which you can do this control. And so that made no sense to us to have the controls on the front panel, let alone, no matter how big the display is, you're still not gonna see the relevant information you wanna see better from two to three meters away as you can absolutely. in your hand. Yeah, absolutely. So with that in mind, we also recognize that by not doing that, we could avoid the cost. It would have to be reflected into the retail price. We avoided the long-term maintenance because these things require um, uh, uh, firmware updates to make sure that they accommodate the input signal that's coming in from the various sources. And, and, and all of those things led us to believe that we shouldn't include it because then we could put the money into the performance aspects of the product. We could put it into the amplification, into the power supply, all of these other things that actually contributed to a better performance. And the other thing too, and I, I may be, it may be not in my place to say this in this platform, but we also grew to understand that there was somewhat, there was a, a little bit of a cynical design approach in putting these on the front displays because we understand that they look cool. They look really great. When I was a dealer, I sold Macintosh amplifiers. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And there was nothing like that big display. And I sold audio research amplifiers. And they have that lovely see-through display now. But those, dis those displays provide relevant information. In a lot of the displays we looked at, we noticed that when you went to the view meter, the, the, the readout of, of power, it was only showing you input and only on digital input. It didn't show you analog, and it didn't show you output, which is what would be the most important information to have. And so while we recognize that it, they look great, and they're very cool, and we're a little bit jealous, as you maybe can tell, it ultimately was not something that passed our logum test, our primary practical design approach test. So we've included just these displays as needed that pop up with your input and the volume, important things that you need to see as we go on. Now, the other example in the SPA25 of this practical design approach is our video switching. About the time we began to design this, this little thing called HDMI 2.1 was announced. And in that build list was a bunch of stuff. And one of the things we knew we wanted, and that was eARC, because of the difficulty in getting standard ARC to work effectively in so many different settings. However, as we began to look at the other specifications, we realized that it wasn't really gonna pass the practical design approach test because almost all of those features, all of those specifications were related more to high speed, high frame rate, high resolution gameplay. 4K mm -hmm. 120, 8K 60. And at the point where we began the design, there weren't even any chips for testing. And that's always a no go for us. And as a result, we decided, well, let's hang back and, and let's see what happens to this and let's do some research into the applicability, exactly just how important will this be? And, and I'd like to think that we were real savvy in that, but it was just coincidence that the first implementation of some of the HDMI 2.1 chips were found to be faulty. And so we were able to avoid the expense uh, that that would have cost having to, to rectify that. But more importantly, as we drilled down to it, and as I mentioned uh, previously, Malmo is a huge game design center. In fact, I have in the apartment building in which I am at this moment, one of their chief designers and their, and their um, uh, human resources person uh, for a company called Massive. Mm -hmm. Now, Massive is part of Ubisoft. They just got through designing the four Avatar games that are meant to go with the four films. And then they've moved on to another little franchise that I don't think is going to be that successful called Star Wars. I don't what? know if you've heard it, but they're doing that. And so 
they, in fact, it was funny to, 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 to have contact with the human resources person because she would do her intern uh, barbecue as the interns were leaving every summer. And I would go down and get a contact high from all those guys and we'd talk about current gaming. But she <laughs> went from hiring 200 people to now 1,200 people that are working on these games. Ooh. And Mass now has an entire city block here, a five-story old sewing machine manufacturing facility uh, that's a city block from which they work. And so tapping into those guys and then talking to specifically their director of uh, gaming culture, and that is a title, um, whose job is to ensure that the consumer is satisfied with the performance of the games. When I mentioned that I wanted to have lunch with him and talk about HDMI 2.1, he put his head in his hands. <laughs> I bet. Well, and, and the thing is, is that an HDMI is really good at this in that promoting advanced video culture, but oftentimes a little bit in advance of when it is actually matured and, 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 and truly available. And so in talking to uh, this guy from Massive, he said, okay, here's the problem. It's, it's, it's in three phases. And part of it is with us. Part of it is with the game designers. It's really hard to do this. We have to ensure that all our games are backward compatible all the way to SD, and then have them available all the way into the highest frame rates. That is a nearly impossible task, but we're doing it and we're making effective games. But the problem then after that point is our art. Mm -hmm. Will our art, will our designs withstand the scrutiny of something at these resolutions? We know frame rate is an interesting thing, but we'll get to that in a second, is will our art actually be benefit from being at these resolutions? And I suggested that it sounded similar to when, uh, um, when the first Hobbit movies were brought out after the great success of The Lord of the Rings, Peter Jackson did them at 48 frames per second, and immediately people started criticizing the video look of the films and how you could see that they were wearing prosthetics and beards and hair pieces and the CGI wasn't quite as good. So that when he did the next installment, he actually downgraded the video for the re-release of that first film and kept it lower for the theatrical release of the second film. Because he's, and, and the, the, the gaming culture uh, director said, yeah, that's it. That's it entirely. Yeah. Um, we have to be very careful about this. And then there's the, the speed, the frame rate. Research has been done with professional gamers that when they're looking at 4K 120 or 8K 60, they can't see the difference. If you do them an A, B thing, they can't see the difference. The interesting thing is that when they play the game at these higher frame rates, their gaming is better. Mm -hmm. They can't see the difference, but the gaming is better. Why is that? Well, because they're using an absolute ultra high speed custom built gaming PC into a custom built peripheral uh, view uh, display. And so the next thing that the gaming uh, culture director talked about was where you're putting these and how they're being used, how these games are being used. Most of the consoles can't consistently do this high level of resolution and high frame rate. And you really need to do it in a gaming PC tied directly to a monitor. And more importantly, he said, what you're talking about is a party game, having it in a surround sound system. If anyone's doing this high frame rate, high speed gaming, it's gonna be with headphones, headphones, microphone, in a PVP, a player versus player scenario. And a party game is never above 4K30, rarely 4K60. And so there'll be no game really designed for this platform. And more importantly, even when someone is doing a PvP game, they will downgrade that signal to 4K30, maybe 4K60 at the most, to make sure that there is no um, uh, 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 delay in the delivery right. of the game. There's no buffering. There's no lag. They will do that already because nothing's in place. And then the final thing that fell into place was that when you talk about cable length, all of a sudden, when you talk about limits of cable length to connect these devices together, people are talking on average of three meters being maximum before you get signal loss. Some people will say five, others will say one meter. And all that communicated to us was that you don't want to have an additional length of cable and a video switching in the way of getting that signal to your display. And so everyone that we talked to, the game designers, gaming culture directors, everyone said, 
plug your game into the display. Right. That way you ensure getting the best possible video quality. It is not a problem getting the audio sent either through HDMI eARC or even Tossing to your audio processor to get the kind of sound quality that you're going to need to be able to have the best performance. And so we determined that it would be a 4K60, the best looking 4K60 video switcher we could possibly have on that for when you want to connect these devices that you want to have connected. But if you're looking for high speed game rate, you should go and plug it into your device, into your display. And this is that extension then of that primary practical design approach. It's not what, as much as it breaks my marketing heart, is going to be most effective uh, on, a, on a features list to sell a product. It is what is going to provide the best possible performance for the investment that any of our customers is going to make in any of right. our products. Thanks so much for that description of the practical design approach. I mean, that is really a an exhaustive, large, broad process. And I think it's very interesting how you use that to really inform your decisions on, on different products and the way that you develop them and select which pieces make it in from a, a feature set point of view. Uh, and I assume this drives all the way down to the physical design of the devices as well, right? Oh God, yeah. In fact, in fact, I'm tomorrow. I'm going to go into a session where we're going to talk about new buttons, and it's the resistance and the sound that they make that will be the key features we'll be looking at. So every single aspect of these products, from the front faceplate to the display to the knobs, the buttons, the inputs, the outputs, the connectors. Um, all of this is put under this scrutiny of the, the primary practical design approach, and it has to provide, it has to provide a performance, a significant performance benefit to effectively pay its way, if you will. Um, uh, it, it, we, we won't include anything just because we know it might be on a feature list that people might prefer with the hope that there will be people that will identify, understand this philosophy and appreciate the fact that they're paying only for what they're really going to use. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and with that, though, we have come to the end of our time today. Uh, so I, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's been a pleasure meeting you and learning That's more about pleasure. the Primer brand. Uh, for everyone out there that's watching, thank you for joining. Uh, make sure to like, subscribe, uh, follow. You want to make sure that you'll be notified when other great content like this comes out. So uh, make sure you push those buttons. Um, and with that, I think, Terry, we can uh, we can say goodbye to everyone. And hopefully you'll join us again one day in the future. I'd love to. Thank you, Giles, for having me. Goodbye to everyone. All right. Take care, everybody. See you guys in the next video.